Good day, I'm Lorraine Mendez and this is your JIS News for Tuesday, May 28. Polygraph examiners within Jamaica's security forces are sharpening their skills at a five-day training session for officers in Jamaica and selected Caribbean countries. Training is being conducted by the Canadian Association of Police Polygraphists and ends on May 31. It's being led by the major organized crime and anti-corruption agency, MOCA. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang says the conference will advance the efficiency of the country's 29 polygraphists. Security is our first business as a government, and we have to invest in it to ensure we build a kind of police and, and military operation that is effective in protecting the integrity of our government. Minister Chang was delivering the main address at the opening session on Monday. He revealed that 1,147 tests using the iDetect technology were done for mass screening of recruits to the JCF and the Department of Correctional Services as part of the integrity screening protocols. The increased capacity within the security sector has allowed us to expand our vetting services, and this is of particular importance. The civil service, which hopefully will help to ensure that only persons of the highest integrity will have opportunity to serve in some of our most sensitive posts within the civil service. The Bank of Jamaica, BOJ, is reporting a 15.2% increase in credit to private sector businesses and households by commercial and merchant banks, as well as building societies. This is for the financial year ending March 2019 and reflects a 1.4% increase over the 2018 period. The figures were announced by the BOJ's Governor Brian Winter at the bank's quarterly briefing recently. While acknowledging that the growth in private sector credit is very encouraging, Mr. Winter says it's still not fast enough. Based on our estimates of the capacity of the Jamaican economy for growth, faster growth is possible without causing inflation to rise above the inflation target. The central bank governor says over $12 billion will be added to the financial system as a result of the lowering of deposit-taking institutions' cash reserve requirements by two percentage points. This reduction takes effect on June 3 and follows a 3% lowering in March. This second reduction in the cash reserve requirement will increase liquidity in the financial system by a further $12.3 billion, thereby supporting the provision of more credit to businesses and households at lower rates and on better terms. Jamaicans are set to benefit from a new pilot program being introduced in Canada for non-seasonal agricultural workers, particularly in the meat and butcher industries. This is being implemented in rural parts of Canada to spread the benefits of immigration to the regions and to retain skilled labourers. Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship for Canada, Ahmed Hussain, tells JIS News that discussions will be held with local government officials on the integration. That industry in Canada particularly is facing a 12% shortage of workers and so that's a severe need at a time when we would like to increase our exports of meat uh, to, to, to the world. So uh, the, the non-seasonal agricultural and agri-food and meat cutting and butcher pilot program will help address some of those gaps. Last week, 100 Jamaicans left the island for Canada to take up employment under the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, SOP. Minister Hussain says the program has benefited both countries. The workers that participate in it, uh, a large number of them are, are returning workers year in, year out. So it shows that uh, uh, they enjoy the work, they benefit from it, they're able to help themselves, their families and their communities. And we. Uh, we benefit from, uh, from, that, uh, from that help uh, that, that enables our farmers to, uh, to harvest their crops and do the, the things that they need to do to succeed. Minister of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries Audley Shaw is reiterating the call for more emphasis to be placed on productivity and human development by both the public and private sectors. This, he says, will stimulate growth in the economy. According to Minister Shaw, production must keep pace with the growth that's taking place in employment. A key pillar in our transformation and the solution to our low productivity output must be the correct matching of skill sets and talents within our organizations as well as the strategic and prioritized training and workers for key sectors. Minister Shaw was speaking at the recent staging of the Organization Development Transformation Conference program. Data from the Jamaica Productivity Center reveals a 1.4% increase in the Productivity Index for 2018. 
the upward movement broke the declining trend, which proceeded from 2013 to 2017. A minimum benefit of $200,000 per year is among a raft of measures outlined in the Tourism Workers' Pension Bill that's currently being debated in Parliament. The Tourism Ministry is providing $1 billion to start the pension fund, which will allow qualified workers who have met the vested five-year period to benefit once the bill is passed. Details of the proposed Tourism Workers' Pension Bill were announced recently in Parliament by Portfolio Minister Edmund Bartlett. The plan will cover all workers aged 18 to 59 years in the tourism sector. This plan, Mr. Speaker, embraces everyone in the sector, whether he or she be red cap, front desk manager, craft trader, housekeeper, raftsman, or any other category of worker in the industry, including, as I said, those who are self-employed. The pension scheme requires mandatory contributions by workers and employers in the industry. For the first two years, the contribution will be 3% of gross salary to be matched by the employer and 5% thereafter. The Financial Services Commission will be responsible for regulatory oversight of this scheme. And finally, Grade 4 students across the island will sit the first official primary exit profile PEP Grade 4 performance task test on May 30 and 31. In a release, Acting Chief Education Officer Winnie Berry says sample questions are available on the Ministry's official PEP website, pep.moey.gov.jm. Mrs. Berry says the website will give educators and parents access to sample practice questions, which are used to assess students' literacy and numeracy competence. She says the Education Ministry continues to support Grade 4 students and teachers as they prepare for the upcoming performance task. PEP is being administered over three years with students sitting exams in grades 4, 5 and 6. Grade 6 students previously sat their ability test on February 26 and their performance task exams on March 27 and 28. Grade 5 students will sit the first PEP Grade 5 performance task test on June 18. And that's it for JI's News Today. I'm Lorraine Mendez. Thanks for watching. Former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Edward Siaga, has passed. He transitioned today at approximately 1 p.m. Jamaica time. Mr. Siaga was receiving treatment in the United States and had his family with him. Today marks his 89th birthday. In a release, Prime Minister Andrew Holness expressed sadness at Mr. Siaga's passing and shared that the family is grateful for the many prayers and messages of comfort and support offered by the people of Jamaica. The necessary arrangements are in place for Mr. Siaga's body to be flown back to Jamaica at the earliest possible time. He was the nation's fifth prime minister. What's the name of the donkey? Christopher, you tell me the name of the donkey. Yeah. To know Edward Siaga is to know the fascinating story of unflinching passion and powerful vision. Though born in the United States of America, he was bred in Jamaica. Not one to be confined, he made his bed in some of Kingston's most spurned inner cities, and the people there were family. I lived, I was part of the community, I was part of the family, I was part of everything that was going on. Edward Philip George Siaga was born May 28, 1930 in Boston, Massachusetts. His Jamaican parents, Erna and Philip Siaga, left the country within four months of his arrival when America began feeling the woes of the Great Depression. They settled down in Jamaica. At that time, the Caribbean country was going through her fair share of problems, among them a reduction in wages and a high unemployment rate. Young Siaga was a disciplined child, but never a conformist. He challenged the system. 
Siaga attended primary schools in Kingston and St. James before continuing his education at the Woolmers High School for Boys in Kingston. It was there that his leadership skills were honed. So too is penchant for demanding excellence. It came from what the headmaster of Woolmers, J.R. Bunting, said to me uh, when I was being appointed as a prefect. He said, if you saw somebody doing something wrong, what would you do? I said, I would caution them. He said, if you saw them again, what would you do? I said, I'd give them a second caution. He said, never give a second warning. But I've not followed that explicitly. But it has been a, <coughs> a background principle in terms of my demands upon performance. The far-reaching effects of World War II influenced the young lad who dreamed of becoming a nuclear physicist. I remember the bombs just going off in uh, Japan and so on. And uh, it fascinated me. And I sent abroad for a couple of books, which I could only um, interpret and read knowledgeably to a certain extent, because a lot of it was mathematics that I had never reached or done. And it fascinated me so much that that is what I wanted to go to Harvard to do. So back to Massachusetts he went, but the drudgery and rigors of medicine got the best of Siaga, and he fell back on natural talents. I discovered the social sciences, sociology, psychology, social anthropology, cultural anthropology, etc. And um, I decided I wanted to switch. And the reason was because, and this you may call another trait, that gave me the opportunity to think from day one because those subjects are not subjects that are written in stone the way the natural sciences are. Siaga graduated from Harvard University in 1952 with a bachelor's degree in social sciences. Most of his studies were geared towards understanding the thought patterns, behaviorism and religion of the Jamaican people However, his passion was for the poorest in society, residents of the so-called inner cities. But after I had done the studies, I realized I needed a platform to be able to make known what I had learned. Because the other Jamaica, of which I speak, the other Jamaica didn't know about this Jamaica. I crossed the bridge. With this wealth of knowledge, Edward Siaga sought to bridge the gap between the lower and middle classes. He made the first connection through music. I had a first-hand first -hand experience of Jamaican folk music mm -hmm. and the, the religious music as well, revival, and coming and things like that. And of course, that to me was the heart and soul of the old Jamaican folk culture. Mm -hmm. So I extended that in the late 50s, about 10 years later, to being a producer of Jamaican music. And I was doing so just at the time when Jamaican music was, the original Jamaican music was emerging. In 1955, he supervised the recording of an album of ethnic music on the Folkways label. It was a project that had grown out of the scholarly research he'd done, but that wasn't enough. Siaga wanted to do more with music, so he founded his own label, WIRL, West Indies Recording Limited, in the late 50s. Among his first signings was the Trenchdown singing duo of Joe Higgs and Roy Wilson. WIRL scored a huge hit in 1959 with their first single, Manio, a scarce single that sold 30,000 copies. That was the same time now that I was moving into politics more, more effectively. So eventually that business was sold and I was able to concentrate more fully. Uh, my background in politics, I had become a, a senator, or a member of the Legislative Council, and I could give politics full time. In his quest to bridge the gap between the lower and middle classes, Politics became a second connection, a springboard for national transformation. He was first appointed to the Legislative Council in the Upper Chamber by Sir Alexander Bustamante 
1959 when he was only 29 years old. Within a year, I was a big name in the, in the Legislative Council, which was at that time full of ABC, uh, uh, Fletcher, um, Kirkwood, you know, the um, establishment on one side. And on our side, it was Dickie Ashenheim and myself and um, Isabel um, Seaton and so on. But because of the kind of analysis that I was able to give to the material and my forceful style of speaking and passion, um, I quickly became the star of the show over there. In the independence government of 1962, he was Minister of Development and Welfare. And in, after the 1967 election, he was Minister of Finance and Planning. He held that portfolio as a member of the Jamaica Labour Party administration, while serving as Member of Parliament in Western Kingston, a seat he would hold for 40 consecutive years. In 1972, Siaga emerged as leader of the JLP, leading the party to victory in the 1980 general election. I remember driving across Kingston because we were enumerated in one constituency and had moved to live in another and had to journey across town for um, casting our votes. Um, in that year we saw the highest voter turnout in the history of Jamaica and the largest margin of political victory by a political party since universal adult suffrage in 1944. So it was a very dramatic, ideologically driven election. The JLP won 51 of the 60 seats in the House of Representatives, a landslide victory over the People's National Party, the PNP. When we win, you could not expect how we die. Tom, I make nice at the time I don't yet. You know, Pavel and Tanchita, Chakamola, make nice. 1980. A 50-year-old Edward Siaga took the oath of office on his way to Jamaica House as the country's fifth prime minister. Leadership came with its opportunities. I have great feeling and passion for the opportunity that politics gave me to be able to deal with my pet about the country's development, and that is the two Jamaicas in which we live. There were also challenges. The one that was the worst one for us was the recession that took place at the beginning of the 19, when it hit Jamaica in 1982-83. But it was a massive recession. It was at that time considered the worst global recession since the Great Depression of 1929. And that signature has been replaced now by what has happened since 2008. But nonetheless, that really created havoc with the economy. And later, regrets. I know that we did a lot of good things, and they're there for the record. But at the same time, you expect that people will understand and appreciate those good things, and you don't have to talk too much about them. Well, that was wrong. Uh, I should have promoted the things that we did, not once, not twice. In Jamaica, everything has to be said three times before it is really absorbed and understood. Edward Siaga served as Prime Minister of Jamaica until 1989, when his party lost the general election to the PNP. By 1989, the po political opponents of Edward Siaga had ideologically repositioned and after two cycles, um, Jamaicans felt that it was time for another change. It was the first of four general election defeats for Siaga, and after 31 years at the helm of the Jamaica Labour Party, the veteran politician walked away from representational politics. He was 74. During the course of his life, Edward Siaga made a profound impact on contemporary Jamaica. This multifaceted, multi-talented pragmatist had established various institutions in the tourism, cultural, political and financial sectors. 
starting from as early as um, 1961 with Things Jamaican. The Jamaica Festival movement is a Siaga creation. The repatriation of Marcus Garvey and his appointment as first national hero was um, a Siaga undertaking as well. There are more recent institutions like the Heart Trust, which was created under his prime ministership. The Urban Development Corporation, UDC, Jamaica Stock Exchange, and Jamaica Unit Trust were also established by Edward Siaga. He also sought the creation of the Jamaica Mortgage Bank, Students Loan Bureau, National Development Bank, Agricultural Credit Bank, Jamaica National Investment Promotion Limited, now Jampro, and the Exim Bank. For the people of West Kingston, though, one of Siaga's greatest achievements was the transformation of what was considered the country's largest slum at the time, an area known as Bakawal, into a modern, low-income residential community renamed Tivoli Gardens. And after more than 30 years, the residents still sing his praises. It was very nice, man. Going better, may I tell you, man. Send your school, any, any complaint you go to it. He, he, he help you, never turn you down. And all them way there. And assist you in every, every nook and cranny and anything. Yeah, money you see. So, I say, what happened? So, we are going to we buy a little drink, huh? And him give and all them things. Then, one sometime, him come and him. Sit down and you run your little joke with him, crack him little joke for him, what's very polite and nice. Because little things can give me as big a moment of joy as the big things. Uh, I like to do things that can help people to develop. Because when you help people to develop, you're helping the country to develop. At the local and international levels, the most honorable Edward Philip George Siaga received several prestigious awards and honorary degrees. Among them, several Doctor of Law degrees from international universities between 1981 and 1987, United Nations Environmental Leadership Award, Dr. Martin Luther King Humanitarian Award, and the Gleaners Man of the Year Award for 1980 and 1981. <laughs> For Siaga, retirement from active politics in 2005 meant more time to devote to his other passions. He took over as president of the Tivoli Gardens Football Club and chaired the Premier League's club association. Siaga also accepted a post as senior research fellow at the University of the West Indies Mona and was later named chancellor at the University of Technology in 2010. He's very goal-oriented. A lot of people think they're successful because they're busy with activities. He makes sure that he knows where he wants to go and that he's actually getting there. It's not just a matter of being busy, you have to achieve the goal. That's a big strength. And he was well beloved by the people. Kind, you know, gentle, sweet, you know. He, he knows what, what the people want, you know. If he, if he sees a problem, you know, he tries to talk, to talk it out. He's a good man, a very great, great man. Every day we miss him and talk about him. We are looking at a, a significant nation builder in the first 50 years of Jamaica's independent history and even dating a little before independence. Uh, it has been a very long political career anywhere in the English-speaking Caribbean or in, indeed across the Commonwealth. Edward Siaga leaves behind a rich legacy for his children, Annabelle, Andrew and Christopher, who are from his first marriage to beauty queen Marie Mitzi Constantine. His second marriage to Carla Vendres in 1997 produced one child, Gabriel. Uh, the two ladies that I've been married to, I must tell you, a man couldn't be more fortunate than I have been. They've been wonderful mothers. It is to them I pay tribute for everything that my children are. And history will pay tribute to Edward Siaga, the scholar, cultural icon, statesman, 
nation builder. The magazine closes for today, but please visit our social media pages. We are just a click away. You may also download our app to be notified of our latest stories and features. Don't forget to give us a like or leave a comment on our pages. Until next time, I'm Adrian Atkinson. To take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.